Am I expressing inflammatory language here tonight in Cape Town, South Africa? These are not my words. These are the words of Israel Shahak, an Israeli Jew, a survivor of the Holocaust, who describes himself as a law-abiding Israeli citizen. He says Israel's, sla Israel's computerized slavery warrants civil war. And he warns also that the next victims of computerized slavery may be the Jews themselves. Evil begets evil. Slavery begets slavery. And he adds this stunning, this shocking note he reports that a majority of Israeli citizens, 58% of them to be exact, according to a recent public opinion poll, believe that internal disruptive forces within Israel are now so powerful that civil war in Israel is inevitable. 58% of Israeli citizens believe that to be true. And how does Israeli Shahak, that great law-abiding Israeli citizen who grieves for his country, how does he feel about civil war? Here are his words given that day at the luncheon event. I prefer civil war to computerized slavery. What has led Israel Shahak and his countrymen to this forecast of civil war? For part of the answer, let me turn to another scene and another person. At breakfast one January morning, this past January in Cairo, I met by chance a Palestinian Quaker who helps young Palestinians in Gaza who are afflicted with an all too common problem, stress. Get a picture of her. She's short. She's dark-skinned, with curly hair. She's given to punctuating her words with gestures and emotional fervor. And she describes the horrors as well as the triumph of life under Israeli occupation. Her first, wor her first name is Mary, and I'm going to leave her name at that. I don't want to give her last name. Let's just call her Mary of Gaza. She read, recited to me two episodes from her own experience. And I want to repeat both of, of them to you. Am I still within my time limit, <laughs> Dr. Didat? Okay. At a conference in Holland, she was midway in a detailed description of the brutality of Israeli soldiers as they inflicted injury and often death to Palestinians in the occupied territory. After she finished her lecture, a Jewish woman in the audience stood up and spoke with great, great emotion in her voice as she said, you can't blame the young soldiers. They don't like what they're doing. Don't blame them. They are simply obeying orders. They are ordered to do these things. In other words, they're carrying out orders. That was this Jewish woman's defense of the brutality inflicted by Israeli soldiers on the Palestinians. When she sat down, Mary of Gaza exploded. Mary of Gaza exploded and she said, you are like a Nazi in speaking as you do. What you have said is exactly what was said in defense of German soldiers at the Jewish death camps during World War II. That the German soldiers should not be blamed. They did not like what they were doing, but they were under orders. But that's not the end of the story. Mary of Gaza told me that after the lecture was over and the crowd left the lecture hall, she found this same Jewish lady sobbing in tears outside. The Jewish lady grabbed Mary of Gaza's hand and begged her forgiveness. She told Mary of Gaza these words. She said, what you have said is right. I was just like a Nazi in what I said. Being under orders was no excuse 
for what the German soldiers did to the Jews during World War II. And being under orders is no excuse for what the Israeli soldiers are doing as well. That's the end of the quote. And to their everlasting credit, many young Israelis are refusing to obey orders these days. Outraged at what the Israeli army is doing to the Palestinians, hundreds and possibly thousands of them simply refuse to serve in the occupied territory. Israel Shahak estimates that the number of those refusing to serve may rise as high as 7,000. He really doesn't know, and I don't suppose anybody else does either. And what is done by the Israeli government to punish those Israeli soldiers who refuse to serve? Nothing, little or nothing, because among those who refuse to serve are some of the great heroes of Israeli military operations. One was the deputy commander of the rescue operation at Entebbe. But other Israelis and other American officials pretend not to see they pretend not to hear. They pretend not to know what's really going on inside Israel. Like Germans during the Holocaust, they cover their ears, they close their eyes, or they simply look the other way. They pretend not to know. And as an American, I hang my head in shame to recount these facts to you. Is Israel headed for destruction? Be reminded, O Israel, of what the Lord said is recorded in the Christian Bible in Amos, second chapter of Amos, verse 3. And I quote from the Christian Bible, Of all the peoples of the earth, I have chosen you, Israel, alone. That is why I must punish you the more for all your sins. For how can we walk together with your sins between us? Would I be roaring as a lion unless I had reason? The fact is, here again I'm still quoting from the Holy Bible, the fact is I am getting ready to destroy you. Is Israel set up for self-destruction? Be warned, O Israel, by the prophetic words of Abraham Lincoln of my home state of Illinois, who said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. This government cannot endure half slave and half free. It will become all one thing or all the other. End of the quote from Mr. Lincoln. Be warned that Israel too will become all one thing or all the other. It cannot survive half slave and half free. Israel is a house divided, half slave, half free. Is Israel set up for self-destruction? Is it too late? It is never too late for goodness and righteousness to prevail over evil. O oh, Israel, be reassured Israel, be inspired by other words of Abraham Lincoln. Here again I quote, In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, generous alike in what we extend and what we preserve. O Israel, let your house, even at this late hour, become all free. Israelis, Assure your own freedom by extending freedom to your Palestinian slaves. Mr. Paul Finley, we say thank you to you for a very informative talk. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now call upon Brother Ahmad Didat to do his share 
And when he has completed his talk, we will put the meeting open to orderly questions. All people who have questions must kindly make their way to this rocket-looking microphone in front of the stage. And when you put your question, please put it and indicate who should answer you, either Paul Finley or Ahmad Dirat. I will go over the procedure of questioning after Brother Ahmad Dirat's talk. Without further ado, I would like first of all to call those people at the back there to come into the arena. I am sure there are far more seats inside available for you. Quietly make your way to those seats. And now, brothers, ladies and gentlemen, Ahmadidat.